Hello everyone, this is Yvonne Johnson and I'm with the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center at Northern Illinois University. So I would like to welcome you to the first of our three online sessions where we will focus on universal design for learning. Today we are going to address part one, which is multiple means of engagement. So the goals for the workshop today are that we will provide an overview of the three areas of universal design for learning. The three areas are multiple, multiple means of engagement, which is related to the affective networks of the brain. The next area is multiple means of representation, and that is related to recognition networks in the brain. And the last area is multiple means of action and expression, and that connects with those strategic networks in the brain. And I'll talk a little bit about the background of this universal design for learning, but the major focus of today will be on discussion of multiple means of engagement in more depth. And then the subsequent sessions, one scheduled for March, is on the second aspect of universal design for learning. And then the session in April is on the third segment of the universal design for learning concept. So now let's practice on the whiteboard because we'll have you engaging throughout the session. So what I would like you, for you to do is go to the top of your screen and click on that T. Click on the T and then you'll see a color palette pops up. So click on the color palette, select your color, and then type in the whiteboard. So the screen is actually a whiteboard I've created so that you can actually type on the screen. So if each of you would please try that, okay, so, um, so people are getting very good at it. Thank you, that's great. Okay, so we have some different colors. Um, somebody's hungry, they're talking about pizza. Kilroy was here, okay. Lynn Herman, um, this is great. Okay, great. So you have just experienced how to type your answer on the whiteboard. Great job. Okay. Another whiteboard practice is, let me clear that off, okay. Another whiteboard um, functionality is that there are shapes. So if you take your cursor and click on, there's a square shape in the top right, top left hand corner, click on the shape and then select the shape. And then you see that the color palette appears again. So click on the color palette And then when you take your mouse and put it on the whiteboard, you see different shapes. Awesome, great, great. Okay, excellent. S group of quick learners, great job. Okay, there's, <laughs> okay, thank you. Some very, very large shapes, that's awesome. Okay, so you got the shapes down. Okay, great. Okay, there's also an eraser, but please don't cl click on the eraser. Um, I'll be using the eraser, but I would appreciate if, if the participants did not use the eraser. Thank you. Okay, so now just to kind of get an idea of, we're hosting these online workshops. So I'd kind of like to know where you are. Are you at home? Are you on campus? Are you somewhere else? Maybe you're at the coffee shop, at the library. So if you could please select one of your whiteboard tools. Okay, thank you, Dan. Select one of your whiteboard tools and indicate in the appropriate area where you are. Okay. So we have um, a tic-tac-toe board <laughs> emerging here. That's awesome. Okay, so many people are on campus. We have a few people at home. Um, some people are at Fermi Labs. Some people are at a different campus. 
So that's great. That's one of the excellent options available in terms of the online sessions that we host so that people can be at various places and we can all engage together. So that's great. Thank you so much. Okay, so this was going to be another whiteboard practice, but I think that all of you have, have it pretty down um, pretty well. So I think we can skip this whiteboard practice. Okay, so to begin the session, my name is Yvonne Johnson, and I'm the Multimodal Teaching Coordinator in the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center here at NIU. And multimodal teaching coordinator means that I work with the online courses, blended courses, as well as face-to-face -face courses. So the topic for today's session is Universal Design for Learning, Part 1, and we'll focus on multiple means of engagement. Today, what we'll, we will be looking at is an introduction and an overview of the Universal Design for Learning um, framework, talked about the three different areas, the multiple means of engagement, connects with the affective networks of the brain. Multiple means of representation connects with the recognition networks of the brain. And then multiple means of action and expression connects with strategic networks of the brain. So for today, we'll be focusing on the multiple means of engagement, the affective aspects of the neural networks of the brain. We'll take a closer look at those affective aspects of the teaching and learning processes, and we'll share tips and strategies for motivating and engaging learners in the teaching and learning process. So that's where we're going. Just to give you a little bit of background on universal design for learning, it's focused on design, of instruction. It's focused on instruction for all students and the instruction that is designed in the universal design framework doesn't need to be adapted. It doesn't need to be specialized. It's designed for all students. It's not an accommodation. So if you're um, thinking about accommodations, that's a different topic. We're talking about designing for all learners. The CAST network, and I will share some resources and some websites at the end of the session. They've done quite a bit of work on universal design for learning. And they explain that it's a framework that create, helps you create and use implement lessons that are flexible. There are different types of goals and methods, materials, assessments that are involved in this universal design for learning. And the idea is to create these varied types of course activities to support all students. And in a curriculum that is focused on and based upon the universal design for learning, the universally designed curriculum provides opportunities for students with a range of abilities from all different ages, um, people who have different types of disabilities, people with different ethnic backgrounds, different who speak different languages, um, have different skill levels of languages, a variety of different experiences and learning styles. And just to kind of get an idea, for those of you that are instructors, how many of you have kind of noticed that you maybe need to use a variety of different teaching techniques to connect with the learners. Does that sound like something that some of you are experiencing in your classrooms today? Okay, okay, so we have different, um, people have said that they have students with different abilities and different needs in their classrooms. Okay, so we'll talk about different ways that you can engage with them. In terms of the universal design for learning framework, the CAST network focuses on the affective 
aspects of learning. And that's really how you engage the learners, how, how the learners get motivated. You know, you really want them running to the class to, um, to get the best seat. One of my colleagues a few years ago taught a high school English class, and she decided to get rid of all of the traditional desks and chairs in her classroom. And she brought in exercise balls and bean bags and fancy chairs and all kinds of different things. And what she noticed was that the students became very motivated to learn. They rushed to her class to try to get the best chair. So that was sort of an interesting novel approach to trying to keep learners engaged in the classroom and get them to really be excited to go to class. So the affective dimensions um, also relate to challenging learners and keeping them interested throughout the entire semester. And the recognition aspects of the universal design for learning relate to more of the knowledge. What are the students going to learn? Where are they going to learn it? The facts um, that they need to learn. How do they take this information in? Do they see it? Do they hear it? Do they speak it? Um, do they read it? So that's the recognition aspects of universal design for learning. And then the strategic aspects of universal design for learning are related to how the learners plan and organize their activities, and also how are they going to demonstrate that they have mastered the, the material or that they have gained the skills that they're supposed to be gaining and refining in your course. So this is another whiteboard activity. If you could just take a moment and think about what motivates students. Think about students just, you know, off the top of your head. What do you think motivates students? And please type your answer or, or write it um, in the, on the whiteboard. Okay, group activities. Okay, incentives, okay, choices, okay, curiosity, okay, developing their own personal goals, interesting topics, innovations, learning knowledge that is relevant to them, okay, um, that's outstanding. You came up with a really good mix of different aspects of motivation. How are you going to um, connect with the students? What's going to keep them engaged in your class? That's great. Thank you. Okay, so this diagram is representative of the CAST um, organization's model for universal design for learning. And as I said, there are the three neural networks of the brain the multiple means of engagement, uh, that's the neural network represented of the affective dimensions, and then the multiple means of representation, that's the recognition network of the brain, and then the multiple means of action and expression, that's the strategic network of the brain. So in these three different sessions, we're going to be addressing those three neural networks, and today we're going to look at the first one the affective dimensions. So the affective dimensions are how do you get the learners engaged? How do they stay engaged? You can't just get them to run to the door and then, and then lose them. We have to keep them engaged and keep them motivated. And people talked about a few different things that help students be motivated. There are innovations and there are challenges and choice. Um, so those are some of the things that we'll talk about today. Okay, so how many people would like their first day of class, whether it's online or face-to-face, -face, how many people dream of their first day of class? Everybody's raising their hand and they just can't wait to get engaged. Raise your hand, please. Okay. Okay, thank you. So many people say, yes, they would love to have students engaged in their class. They want them to be engaged. We want them to be 
interacting. We want them to be enthusiastic. We want them to be creative. So how do we do that? Think about um, what motivates students, and we're connecting with this UDL framework. So this is a whiteboard activity. And you can answer the question by responding in one of the boxes or all of the boxes. Either way is fine with me. So if you think about the question, I believe students are motivated to learn when. So if you think they're motivated to, work, to learn when they're ready to learn, when their temperament and disposition is um, at that nice balance where they're ready to learn, then you would fill um, mark in that box. If you think they're motivated to learn when their skills and knowledge connect with the course content, then you would mark in the second box. If you think they're motivated to learn when their goals and self-regulation strategies fit the course requirements, then you would mark in the third box. And you would mark in the last box if the course instructions support and the feedback that is all integrated with the course meets the learner's needs. So if you would please mark in those boxes with your answers. OK. OK. OK, so, um, so we have a number of people who have said that students are motivated to learn when they're ready to learn, when their temperament and disposition is, is at that right balance. Um, we have a number of people who said that their skills, knowledge, and, and knowledge connect with the course content. How many of you have um, ever taught a course where um, it's a required course? And some of the students aren't necessarily um, thrilled to be there. OK, all right. So we have several people who have said that they have taught a required course. So when you're teaching a required course, um, how is that different than when you're teaching a course that students, um, you know, it's an elective and they really wanted to take it? Are they, is their motivation the same in a course that is required compared to a course that is um, more of an elective type of course? Okay, good point. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. That's a good point. Um, it varies. And um, when students are taking an elective, okay, so they, they might be more motivated if they've chosen the course or um, they might be engaged in a mandatory course. It just kind of depends on the students. Um, but yes, their investment in the course, that's an important point to raise. Thank you. And one of the points is that it depends on the student. Um, but usually specialized courses attract more engaged students. OK, so you can kind of see that um, the affective dimensions impact the students um, and the teaching and learning uh, process. Dan, did you have a question? I see your hand is raised. OK, thank you. OK, so we can see that the temperament and disposition impact the uh, motivation of students. Their skills and knowledge. What happens if the course is very advanced and the student is more of an entry level? Um, they don't have those advanced skills. How does that impact their motivation? Mismatch. OK, yes, good point. Um, might result in discouragement. OK, yep. OK, um, in the third box, their goals and self-regulation strategies fit the course requirements. So if a student's goals match the course requirements and they have those study skills and self-regulation skills that are at the same level as required for the course, um, then that's a pretty good fit. But what happens if their skills of self-regulation are at one level and the course expectations are at a different level? What happens then? OK, so um, they could struggle. Their motivation might go down. OK, 
They might need more support from the teacher. Okay, that's great. So those are good points. So that's going to impact the types of things that the students are going to need from you as an instructor. Or as uh, Dan said, they might stop showing up for class. So that's a good point. Okay, so uh, great discussion on those topics. You can see that there's a lot of complexity here um, in the motivation and how that impacts students in the courses. Okay, so we had the students say we're all raising their hands and, um, but what happens if you walk in the first day of class and this is what you see? Um, so what strategies, um, we don't know why the students are, are not, um, not appearing excited to be in the class, but, but if you walked in and the students were, um, you know, kind of looked like they um, weren't excited, what would you do to try to engage these students? to try to make a connection with those students, to start the class off on a positive note. Um, this is a whiteboard activity. Okay, so Matt says use activities. Great, okay. Icebreakers, yep, okay. So activities, um, icebreakers, okay. Um, an icebreaker is a really good activity. I use those in my classes a lot and um, that's actually the first thing that I do in my classes when I start a semester is I'll have an icebreaker introduction activity that is connected with the course content, but it also is connected to the students as individuals. It allows them to share their, um, their interests, something uh, maybe they have hobbies, something about their family or their pets and what their desire and interest in the class are. And I always start the class off with that so that we kind of all know where every student is starting. Um, relate the course to their lives and goals. Yes, that's an excellent point. So show how this course, whether it's an elective or it's a required course, how it can be related to their lives and goals and how they can work with you as an instructor to connect the course with their lives and goals. Yes, that's awesome. So icebreakers, activities, um, show them the connections between the course content, the discipline and um, relevancy to their lives and goals. That's outstanding. Thank you. Okay, so this is, um, um, can also ask what's going on today. Okay, that's an awesome suggestion that if, if the students do look like they're um, not necessarily engaged, you might ask them what's going on today. Maybe something happened and they need to talk about it. That's an outstanding example. Thank you. And it connects with the diagram that's on the screen that shows the variables that impact the learners and the engagement with the um, tasks. Okay, so we have, um, when you look at this screen, what do those symbols or icons say to you? Just type um, at the top of the screen, use your, um, whiteboard tools to type, when you look at the screen, what does that tell you? Um, okay, social media, yep, branding, web stuff, yep. Okay, so another thing is that there's a lot of information coming to students in from many different avenues and it comes rapidly. And we can use these different tools to engage with the students, um, try to help them to manage the tools, the online tools, the social media. We're in a very connected world and it's important to use those tools to our benefit um, it can be um, sometimes a challenge when information is coming from all of these different sources. So how do we help them when information is coming from all of these sources? How do we help them to focus on the material, the, the course, um, to be the most successful that they can be in the course so they can get to that finish line? 
So some of the different suggestions that people provided earlier um, relate to student interests, connect the content to something that is important to them. And one of the things that you can do is have them bring in information. It doesn't have to always be you coming up with the ideas. Have the students come up with ways that, that they can connect the types of content that you're studying in the course with their interests. Um, many people use these activity trackers. Um, that's actually a picture of the activity tracker I have on my arm right now. Um, selfie sticks. People, everybody has a selfie stick now. So you could have them take pictures of things that they're interested in that connect with your course, give them choices, and then have them explain how the course concepts apply to these different pieces of information that, that they're interested in. Um, allows them some flexibility. And authenticity, someone brought that up earlier, needs to connect with their lives and their goals. This photo at the bottom of the screen is of the NIU engineering students, uh, one of the students who worked on that, um, the car, the car that gets, I don't know, it's a thousand miles per gallon or something like that. It's, it's amazing. So that's an authentic type of task. Now, um, what types of authentic tasks do you use in your class? You could type them in this um, box at the bottom, the white box, or you could type them in the chat box. Um, we have people who are in uh, some of the hard sciences. We have people who are in kinesiology and um, some of the health sciences. Performances, okay, awesome. Okay, so um, Musical performances, um, okay. What else? Um, one of the people who is um, scheduled for the session today is, is in art, the field of art. So that might be an authentic experience for them to produce a piece of artwork. Okay, so use, have them use ethical dilemmas. That's an authentic experience. That's an excellent, excellent suggestion. Okay, teaching sample lessons. So if they're in the education department and they're going to be teachers, you have them teach lessons, that's outstanding. Or a museum visit. So these are all excellent examples of authentic types of activities that when the students are in your class, they're not just reading or having lectures, they're actually being engaged and they're out collecting data and the um, topics are tailored to their interests as well. So they might select which museum they visit, or they may have the option of selecting different ethical dilemmas that they need to discuss. Um, that's excellent. Thank you very much for sharing those. Those are excellent examples. Okay, um, so if you were, we had some examples of authenticity, um, museum, vi museum visits, um, performances. What about choice? The box and the far, um, what type of a choice could you provide to the students in terms of activities for your class and meeting the requirements for your class? You can write the answer in the box to the bottom left, or you can write the answer in any of those boxes. Okay, um, so one person said that different tech tools could be used, so they wouldn't necessarily have to use the same tech tools. Um, what about different course assignment options? They could do a case study based on an internship experience. Okay, that's an excellent example. Um, a case study that's um, they've had an authentic experience, they had an internship, and then they completed a case study that's outstanding. Okay, choose the type of submissions, video versus paper report, that's outstanding. I taught a class a couple of years ago, and it was a blended class, so some of the sessions were online, and some of the sessions were face-to-face. -face. 
and one of the students was not um, that engaged in the course. And I was thinking about, you know, how what could I do to try to provide more options to the students? And um, they knew that they could use different options to respond to the discussion boards and complete the assignments. But I felt like I needed to be more explicit about that. So I gave them some more specific examples and said for the discussion boards that they could use video or they could use infographics or a podcast or they could type or a um, variety of different ways to meet the assignment requirements. And when I explained to the students that they had those options, one of the students that really had not engaged much, it was as if he, his voice was just found. He created this video and he started to share so much more. So it really was one of those points in time when it brought to my attention how important the different options for students are in the course. Um, and now we have voice to text type of tools. So if a student isn't necessarily as good of a writer, they might use one of the voice to text tools and then they have their um, Pay, you know, a rough draft of a paper typed out, and then they could refine the English mechanics type things. Um, so yes, um, different types of submissions. We talked about their interests and authenticity. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Okay, another aspect of the universal design for learning in terms of the affective network is, do the students think that they can be successful? And sometimes students might be stressed out about a course. They may think that they're not necessarily prepared for the course, their requirements, or that they're, um, they, they're just not sure that they can be successful. So as an instructor, we can do things to try to help them to be successful. Another aspect of the affective network is in terms of the expectations um, that we provide. And I use rubrics a lot in my courses so that students have a clear understanding of the expectations. And they really do seem to be motivated by those rubrics because they know what is clearly expected and what they need to do to be successful in class. So in your classes, this is a whiteboard activity. What strategies could be used in your class um, to help students think that they can be successful. One of the things that I do, as I said, I use rubrics. I provide different um, types of assignments, uh, clear expectations. In face-to-face -face and online classes, use partner activities or group activities. What strategies do you use in your classes to help students think they can be successful? Um, okay, so include topics or content that's tailored to their interests and then that helps them to think they, they could be successful. Okay, that's great. Okay. Use exemplars. Yes, that's an excellent example so that they can see what was a, a good example of a completed product from your previous course. That's a great example of um, something. So then the students say, yes, I know what this assignment is supposed to look like. I can do that. I can be successful. And then they're more motivated to be engaged in the process. OK. Um, so one person said they have a variety of different activities to help reinforce topics. OK, that's excellent. So you're using different ways to connect with the students. Um, so if someone's not a great test taker, they can earn points. That's, that's an excellent way to help students realize that they can be successful. So, so some people are great at tests, taking tests, and some people aren't. So you've provided a variety of different options so that the students who are great at tests have that option to gain points, and students that are not so great at tests can earn points in different ways, whether it's through um, engaging with other students or completing different types of activities. Yes, that's great. Um, 
One person divides a large product uh, project into smaller parts and assigns different deadlines and provides feedback. That's an outstanding way to scaffold a project. That's what we call it in the instructional design field is scaffolding. So if there's a large project and you break it into pieces, then at each different time when a certain part of that project is due, students are getting feedback and they're they're getting information from you as the instructor that tells them that they can be successful and that they're moving in the right direction. That's an excellent example. Thank you. Um, and then presentations. This person says that they provide a demo model of the behavior so that the students know exactly what their presentation should look like. So again, that's an exemplar. That's an excellent um, strategy. So the students know what the, the presentation is supposed to look like. They can see the expectations and they have a sample. So if they're a person who is a learner who wants to reflect on something, then they can look at the video example, look at the exemplar, think about it, and then do their work. They can look at it again if they need to. So that's great. Um, another person said that they use group activities of students with different skill levels. So you can combine students. Some of the students who are more advanced can work with students who have um, not as advanced skills and so that they're sharing information and constructing knowledge together. That's great. Okay, thank you so much. Another aspect of the engagement, the affective network that we're talking about today is that um, in some courses, it, you can provide different levels of challenge for the students. This might not work in all courses, but it is an option that you can provide in some courses. Another aspect of the um, affective network is balancing the demands and the resources. So if the student feels like they're um, is a significant amount of workload due for the course, but they have the support and the resources required, then they think that they can be successful. They believe and they're motivated that they can do um, a great job on this project, but there has to be a balance. If they feel like there's um, extensive demands for high level work, but not the corresponding resources, then their motivation might not be as high. In terms of providing different levels of challenge, um, one of the courses I taught a few years ago was an educational technology course. And some of the students came into the course with extensive experience with a wide variety of technologies. technologies. Other students came into the course with, with very, um, very little experience with the educational technologies. So I worked with a co-instructor and we set up these three different levels of challenge so that people who were very new to the technologies could learn from a foundational level and build on that. Those that were kind of in the middle had some experience but not advanced could start from that baseline. And those that were very advanced could start much farther along in that uh, challenge level and then move from there. So that was an adaptation that we made to that course after we met the students. And it was received very well because the students who were very new to those tech tools felt that they gained knowledge, they felt confident that they were learning, um, and they moved forward. But the students who were very advanced didn't have to start at that foundational level. They started much more advanced and moved from there. So it was a very effective strategy that we really hadn't designed the course um, in that way. But during that first session, we learned that, OK, we need to kind of adapt this to meet the needs of the learners. And it, it turned out to be a really great experience. Has anyone ever um, provided different levels of challenge for students in their courses? Do we have any examples of that? You could write it on the um, on the screen if you would like. It looks like that might be more of a new um, or something that doesn't necessarily apply to the courses taught by the people in the session. Um, so as I said, some of the concepts do apply to um, 
various courses, and some of them kind of come up as needed, which is what happened in our course. Okay, um, so if you were going to design a course that provided different levels of challenge, how might you do that with your classes? Um, we have some people who teach in the arts. We have people who teach in science. Um, okay, so um, one person said different types of labs. So that might be something that you could do is to have different experiences with um, science type of labs. Uh, there's some people in here with uh, that teach kinesiology. Maybe they could use those fitness trackers and you could have people start at different levels. If they've been um, engaged in that 10,000 steps a day, maybe they could change their base to a different number. Okay, so we have uh, somebody who teaches activity classes um, and there's always ways to adapt and modify the content. Okay, so yoga poses, that's an outstanding example. So depending upon the person's skill level, they can change, you can adapt the yoga pose. That's outstanding. Okay, so definitely applies to the um, kinesiology and uh, PE. Great, thank you so much. All right, so, and also one of the things that is important when you're expecting um, very complex work if you provide those corresponding resources, which we're very fortunate that we do have um, resources available on the internet now. So we can provide a lot of support to students that we would have been more difficult to provide prior to all of this engaged and in internet type of activity. Okay, so thank you very much for sharing that in terms of the um, and kinesiology department, thank you. Okay, one of the things that we in faculty development rolled out last year to try to provide um, different options to instructors and students was our Blackboard portfolio tool. So that's a, a tool that you can use, and this is a screenshot of a portfolio, but it's a tool that you can use to help motivate students. They can store their examples of their coursework, they can write information, or they could create a video to introduce themselves, and they can use this portfolio tool to collect information about their experiences, their coursework, and use it in college, and they can use it once they're graduating and when they're looking for a job. Um, okay, go ahead, thank you. So that's something if you're interested in, you can call uh, Contact Faculty Development and we're happy to help you. Other examples that you can use, and we have seminars on some of these are, you can create social learning communities and somebody a couple of times throughout the day talked about um, group activities. So you might try to build learning activities where people solve problems together. Helps with motivation and their social and academic engagement so that the students and the instructor are supporting each other. They can be creative. Someone mentioned earlier about different types of um, activities, um, connecting it with students' interests. We talked about case, uh, we talked about authenticity. And case-based learning is something that you can do. Someone brought up ethical dilemmas earlier. You could also use workplace stories or best practices in the workplace. We have some people from management in the session today. Um, provides multiple perspectives, which is something that we saw today. We had people from quite a few different disciplines. And so bringing that experience together creates a really multifaceted learning community that helps us to see different perspectives and see things in a new way. And that keeps students engaged and motivated in the course. So um, we just have a few minutes here. I will share some resources with you. Um, I'll send those in the email that I send after the session is over today. 
The Center for Applied Special Technology is CAST. That's the center that has done quite a bit of work on the universal design for learning. So I'll send you those links so that you can see their the uh, resources and tools that they have available. There are many, many resources for you. Okay, so I would like to thank everyone for their engagement today. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me or contact us at Faculty Development. And you can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you at more sessions. Have a great day.